Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, for joining us again on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, Art Kirsch and I are with the fabulous John Mariani, uh, he of the Virtual Gourmet Newsletter fame. John, great to see you again. Nice to be back. Hey, John. <laughs> yeah, John, I have a, a question. Um, uh, my sister, uh, when we go when we go to dinner with my sister from time to time, it seems that she always gets put near a service area, uh, whether it be the, the, the door, it just... It's it's a genetic thing, maybe, and but she always complains that we get moved around a little bit. But uh, I guess there often, is. Excuse me. How often does she bathe? Uh, <laughs> no, just you know, it's uh, the, the the problem with it is the not bad tables, other than the fact that you know you have waiters and waitresses clinking and clanging and uh, uh, yeah. in your earshot. But getting a good table. Uh, on, when you go into a restaurant, are they sort of like laid out? These are the best, and these are the not so good. And and how do you get the better tables? Is there is there a method to the madness? I gotta ask a question. If you were opening a restaurant, why would you want to designate good and bad tables, knowing that? 70% of your clientele are going to wonder, am I at a bad table? <laughs> I mean, it is, it is just the craziest thing. That is not to say there are not good or bad tables. There are some tables that overlook the window. There yeah. are some tables in the corner. There are some tables on the banquettes as you enter that are very, very nice tables, but not to the exclusion of every other table in the place. Now, does this matter to a lot of people? Oh, oh, oh does it ever matter? Um, it matters so much that they will stalk out, that they will pay, grease the palm of the maitre d' right up front. I mean, I expect a great table, you know? Um, and again, it's in the perception of the person, largely, largely speaking. But let's go back a little <clears throat> when, and especially out there in uh, Los Angeles and Hollywood, um, there is a lot of the remaining uh, attention to what is a good table and what is a bad table. How dare you seat me here And so in Siberia? Well, that goes back to a woman who started out as a chorus girl and somehow uh, pierced her way through um, New York society um, and got in with the swells. And her name was uh, Peggy Hopkins, <clears throat> Peggy Hopkins Joyce. And she was well known around town. So she came walking into the big deal places like El Monaco and El Morocco and the Stork Club and so forth. Um, oh, right this way, Miss Hopkins, you know. And she'd usually be sitting next to uh, the mayor of New York or some fancy Cuban playboy or something. Well, this time she showed up and they said, right this way. And they took her to a table to the rear. Well, she went into shock and said, where are you taking me, to Siberia? Well, it caught on. Um, the term caught on, as did the, uh, I don't know who invented the other one, but the doghouse. Where are you taking me to the doghouse? Um, because the where you sit at places like that in New York and in Hollywood are primo important to show how important you are. And you hear the stories told, especially in Hollywood, that if you've been sitting at table 14 for the last two years, because you do just produce three blockbuster movies, but your last two movies went, suddenly they show you to table 19, which is not so favorable. That, and look who's sitting at your table, the new young kid who just uh, scored such an enormous hit in Jaws 12. Um, that does continue to go on, certainly in restaurants in Los Angeles, uh, more so in, than in New York. I and mean, then to go to a place like Spago or Mr. Chow in Beverly Hills um, is to see that in operation. Now, I think there's a very good rationality for that. There shouldn't be obviously great tables and lousy tables. That's, that's preposterous and counterproductive to running a business. But um, if, in fact, a major movie star comes walking in um, 
I, you're not gonna say, yeah, yeah, I just wait a minute. You know, I shut you over to the show. Why don't you go have a drink at the bar? Of course, that's not gonna happen. They know that he or she is coming, so that Angelina Jolie is gonna get the table that she desires. That's, you know, so would I give it to her because when people come in, hey, look who's here, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> also, oh, she's calling right now. Um, also, the uh, producer or the head of Paramount or the executive producer of uh, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, he comes in and he's, they're even more demanding, actually, um, because they're not beautiful people. They demand it on the basis of uh, their power. Um, this used to be more significant in New York for the business lunch, <clears throat> because, but several of those places that uh, would be like that, like uh, the 21 Club is, is gone. The Four Seasons is gone. But nobody wanted to see it in the Four Seasons in the beautiful pool room because the action was going on in the not-so-beautiful grill room. But that's where the hot shots sat. Well, that's gone. Okay, 21 Club. If you were sent off just to the right of the first room that you entered near the bar, just to the right, Outside the area, except if you saw the movie Sweet Smell of Success, the very, very powerful um, gossip columnist played by Burt Lancaster deliberately sits in Siberia to show that I choose my table. You don't. And I'm bigger than those other people over there who have to have their table in the A room. And uh, you also remember Michael Douglas in Wall Street invites the young acolyte to 21 club and of course gets an a table and uh he says so what you're going to order and he says oh i don't eat lunch lunch is for wimps what was important was to get that table well those two places don't exist anymore uh so there's less chance of that happening also you know covid just destroyed expense accounts or even the um uh, possibility of going out to eat so that a lot of that is gone um having said that uh, in, in terms of the perception of you and I and others who go and think, am I being sent to Siberia? I mean, and so Le Cirque was a big deal society restaurant back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and it closed about five years ago. Um, and here was a place where if you went in, you would recognize half the people, well, most of the people sitting against the uh, right-hand wall uh, at the entrance, and that could be um, Bill Blast, the fashion designer. It could be Sophia Loren. It could be the head of Paramount in New York. Um, it could be uh, the head of the New York Times. So those were the A tables, and they always got those tables. So Ruth Rachel, who was the food critic for the Los Angeles Times um, uh, for a long time, she is drafted by the New York Times even better position, to be the New York Times restaurant critic. So she comes. She's a New Jersey girl, but thoroughly L.A. And she comes, and she doesn't really, she's used to, you know, not so fancy places, and Le Cirque is very fancy, and you really had to dress up. Uh, women love to dress up. She is a not attractive person. She has, there's no way you could not know it is her, because she has masses of hair like Medusa. She's a very good critic, by the way, a very good writer. So she goes to Le Cirque first time, and she doesn't get one of the, there's only like eight so-called eight tables for regulars who go there three times a week, you know? So she doesn't get one of those tables. So she's been tre being treated badly. She says, the food was awful. I just got a lot of gray and brown food. And... So she goes back a few more times as they are want to do. And she says, ah, they recognize me the next time. And I got a better table and the food was exquisite. So she writes a uh, st story with two columns in it. If you go to Le Cirque as a nobody, you'll be giving a, shitty, sh a, a, a less than perfect table as she perceived it. And you, the food will come out of like a completely different kitchen where they make brown and, and gray food. 
And when I was recognized, the food just glistened and glowed. It was colorful and exquisite and so forth, even though I ordered it. They didn't send it out. So it, it was preposterous because I know the owners of the sir. They said, we knew who the knew her the moment she walked in. We did not want to fawn over her because she would think, oh, we discovered her. So we gave her a very nice table. So a few years go by, and Le Cirque moves to another venue, uh, still very posh. And Ruth Rajo shows up, and she's given the table right inside the door of the restaurant, which she perceives to be a bad table. And reports on it as such. Well, I have never sat at that table because I am not Sophia Loren, whom I've seen dining at that table. I am not Anthony Quinn, who sits at that table. Uh, so, you know, it was total misperception on her part, but she carried, carried it back to the newsroom and typed in, I got the bad table again. So it, it's all in the perception. So you want to get a good table, here's what you do. Um, first of all, call in advance, get a reservation. Not a bad idea if you scouted out the restaurant beforehand, just drop in and see the layout and ask for a specific table as and says, if you can provide it, say to the host, Major D, we'd love to sit by the window. If it's possible to sit on the terrace, we would like that. And almost invariably, they say, well, I'm not sure we can't always promise because we don't reserve tables like that, but we will do the best that we can. You could try the old ploy of it's my wife's birthday and so forth, um, which which is going to work because they don't want to not fill those tables, especially these days. So that's the first thing. Second thing, when you go um, and you show up and and this has happened to me where an almost empty dining room, people are starting to arrive. I was given the worst table. Um, I didn't design it to be that way, but it was next to the kitchen door. It was not a great table. Place was almost empty. And I said, could I have another table? And they gave me a withering look like, where would you suggest? Well, those are the old days. That doesn't happen anymore. You go in and they start leading you to a table and you see a lot of tables over there empty. Say, would it be possible for us to sit over there? There's no reserve signs on them or anything. And believe me, they said, of course you can sit over there unless it's served for the, you know, Lord and Lady douchebag coming in this afternoon, but it's not any longer. Um, the last thing is how about greasing the palm um, up front? Um, a good maitre d' will not allow that, but it does go on. Here's 20 bucks. But as one despicable restaurateur said, 20 bucks, that'll just raise my eyebrows. 50 might get you a table. I mean, it's really... Spickle. That doesn't go on much. Now, if you do want to be a regular or intend to be a regular, you know, a regular somebody goes two or three times a month where you walk in and they say, oh, Mr. Mariani, Mr. Coleman, so good to see you uh, again. And um, on the way out, you tip Tony 10, 20 bucks. And say, Thank you so much. We had a terrific thing. I'd love to get that table again next next time I come. That's a very good way. But that's because you really do like the place, you like the food, and uh, you do intend to come back. Uh, as I said, my father frequented three or four restaurants, one near his office, one near where we lived, another one in Manhattan, and they all knew him, and uh, it was not, not a big deal. Um, so those are, but start off with the fact that you are not Angelina Jolie, and you are not the mayor of New York, and you are not some Wall Street guy who, flip buying thousand dollar bottles of wine if you are any one of those things you shouldn't have to worry but if you are not they want to sit you and sit you down not to put you in your in your place but to serve you a wonderful evening because they love you to come back again and spend money why would they not <laughs> good good real good point you know there unfortunately there are restaurants maybe not La Cirque but there are restaurants that try to cram all the tables in. And those are the ones that end up having a table too close to the kitchen or too close to the front door or too close to the whatever. And granted, it's all in the eye of the beholder, but let's face it, nobody wants to be in the path of all the ser every server going to the kitchen, coming back and forth to the kitchen. Oh, but remember, especially these days, uh, tables are real estate. 
Um, yeah. I'll tell you that. I've got to make so much money off a table. And if I can squeeze another one. And the funny thing about Le Cirque is that it'll start off the evening with its usual 80, I don't know, 40 tables. Uh, but there's space between them. And if somebody unexpected, like literally the king of Spain comes in, they say, oh, of course we have a table for you. And they, they, two guys, two waiters come and they put another table right here. <laughs> I've seen it happen many times. And it's very, very funny. But uh, when Syria, now at, at Atlas Cirque, Syria, Syria Montreal, the owner, one said when somebody complained about sitting this close to the next table, and he says, Senore, he says, would you rather sit this close or that close to Sophia Loren? Because she's going to be next to you tonight. Rubbing <laughs> <laughs> the little elbows. Cap, cap it's nice to have that choice, isn't it? Yeah. Well, for my part, this is my parting thought. For my part, going to a restaurant regular that I'm uh, semi-regular at. My favorite tables are the ones that are not near the loud speak, the, the music speakers. That's what that's my determination. It's not the window, it's not sitting next to an A star. Mm. It's not, you know, being seen. It's just don't put me under the damn music. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I I hate that myself. I, I often I often ask them if it's possible to turn it down. Sure. Uh, I think anybody came to your restaurant to listen to disco music. Uh, oh, it creates, we've talked about this before, but you can have to turn it down. I think one of the uh, uh, more interesting things that you said, and I agree with you, is that no matter where they seat you, if it's a decent restaurant, you're going to get the same quality food no matter where you are. Uh, they're not going to uh, dumb oh, down the food because you're sitting. Oh, that is, that more is. Part, because they want you to come back. My sons both work in as, as both waiters and cooks, and they never, my son who, who worked at the Mott at a very big deal restaurant next to the Museum of Modern Art, he says, I never got an order coming in that say, that said, oh, Angelina Jolie is at table 14, don't screw it up. Um, never. He says, because that intimidates the staff. You know, we're trying to turn a 20 version of risotto and suddenly we've got to stop things to Angelina Jolie's risotto. No. Well, I, I th so the, the, the perfect, I think the real answer is you make the table an A table. Right. All right, you got it. So John, thank you John. much. Uh, and uh, um, the, th the, three, the three amigos here will always have an A table because we'll make sure that we get a good bartender. And then the table will be whatever it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.